Hey guys, in this video we will be doing a revision for the physics topic measurement. This is specially tailored for KSSM from 4 chapter 1. But if you just want to learn measurements as a topic, you are welcome to watch this video as well. Let's get to it. Under measurement, we have two main topics that is physical quantities and scientific investigation. First, let's get through some definitions for this whole topic. What is a physical quantity? A physical quantity is basically something that can be measured. Under physical quantity, we have base quantity as well as derived quantity. A base quantity is a physical quantity that cannot be derived from any other physical quantities. Whereas a derived quantity is a physical quantity that is derived from other physical quantities. We will see examples of those in a while. What is a scalar and vector quantity? So physical quantities can be divided into scalar and vector as well. A scalar quantity is a quantity that only has magnitude. It has no direction. A vector quantity is a physical quantity with both magnitude as well as direction. We will look at examples of those as well. Let's go to the next part. When it comes to physical quantities, we have the magnitude of the quantity and the unit. So the units, we have two systems of units, that is the metric unit, metric system and the imperial unit system. For length, for example, the metric system, the units are centimeters, meters, kilometers, millimeters and so on. These are the units used for length in the metric system, but in the imperial system, we use units such as inch, feet and mile. For pressure, the metric unit is pascals or kilopascals or millimeter mercury. But for the imperial unit, we have pounds per square inch. And then for mass, the metric unit is grams or kilograms. This is the most commonly used. For imperial unit, we have pounds and ounce. Let's go to base quantities and derived quantities. There are seven base quantities. Remember, base quantities are quantities that cannot be derived from other quantities. First, we have length, and then we have mass, and then time, and temperature. So these are common things that we measure in the laboratory during experiments. Length, mass, time, and temperature. Now we also have electric current, which we also measure in the lab. And then we have amount of substance. Those of you who are studying chemistry, you will understand amount of substance as well as luminosity. Let's look at the symbol for the base quantity. It's important to remember that these are the symbols for the base quantity. I will explain why later. And the symbol for length is simply L. Mass is M. Time is T. Temperature is capital T. The caps matters here. Electrical current is capital I. Amount of substance is N. And luminosity is I subscript V. As we saw earlier, these quantities can have various units. And so we have something called the SI unit. SI unit is set as the standard unit to be used. And the SI unit for length is meter. For mass is kilograms. It's not necessarily the smallest unit. And then for time, we have seconds. Temperature is Kelvin, not the more commonly used degree Celsius. Electrical current is amperes. Amount of substance is mole. Luminosity is candela. And the symbols for the units. So this is where some confusion arises. These symbols are for the units. Earlier, we looked at symbols for the quantity itself. The symbol for meter is small m. And this is the greatest confusion because we have two small m's here. So when do we use this? This m is the symbol for the physical quantity. And therefore, it is used in formulas where mass is involved. When we're trying to represent the length of an object, then the unit for that quantity is in meters. So we write m at the back. For example, a 100 meter run. The m will be small m. That represents the unit for the 100 meters. Whereas m, when we use in a formula such as f is equals to ma, that means force is equal to the product of mass and acceleration. The symbol for kilogram is kg. Second is small s. Kelvin is capital K. Ampere is capital A again. Mole is just M-O-L without the E and candela is C-D. These are the base quantities. Let's look at derived quantities. I've just chosen four here. There are many derived quantities. But let's just look at these examples. So we have acceleration here. Symbol for acceleration is small a. The formula for acceleration is delta V over T. That is the change in velocity per unit time. 
let's try to write this formula in terms of base quantities. So we're going to look at this formula and whatever is not a base quantity, we're going to write it in terms of the base quantities. Remember the seven base quantities earlier. And here time is already a base quantity. We don't have to do anything with time, but velocity is not one of the seven base quantities. Therefore velocity in base quantity will be length over time because velocity is displacement over time. Displacement is simply length. We still have to divide this by time. And so the formula in terms of base quantities will be length over time squared. Once we know the formula in terms of base quantities, we can also determine the units in terms of SI base units because now we have them in the base quantities. The unit for length is meters. So it is meters. And the SI unit for time is second. Since we have t square here, it will be second square. So the units in terms of SI base units will be meter per second square. Or we can write this as meter per second square. There are no special SI units available for acceleration. Let's go on to the next one. Charge, the formula is Q is equals to I times T. Once again, T is already a base unit and I is a base unit as well. I is the symbol for current. And therefore, the formula in terms of base quantities is the same, I T. Now we can find the units in terms of SI base units. That is, the unit for current is ampere and the unit for time is seconds. So S, ampere seconds. There is a special SI unit for charge, that is capital C, which stands for Coulomb. Let's look at the next one. By the way guys, I've spent many, many, many hours developing these notes. If you'd like to support me, I'll leave a link in the description on how you can buy these notes. Let's look at force. Force is equal to MA, mass is already a base unit, but acceleration is not. Now let's just copy from what we already did earlier. Acceleration is length over time squared. And so we can write force as mass times length over time squared. And this is simply ml over t squared. And now we can find the SI base units based on the formula. Mass is kilograms. The SI unit for length is meters. The SI unit for time is seconds. So over second square. And therefore we can write this as kilogram meter per second square. And the special unit for force, this is a more common one, that is Newton, capital N. Let's look at the next one, pressure. Pressure is force per unit area. Force is not a base quantity, area is not a base quantity as well. So we need to do both, therefore pressure is force. We can copy force from what we did earlier, ml over t square. So this will be ml over t square over area. Area is simply length times width, which is also another length. So length times length, therefore we get L squared. And this will become ML over L squared T squared. And now we can simplify this further. We can get M over L T squared. Now we can find the SI base units. The SI base units M stands for mass. Mass is kilograms over length is meter and time is second, so second square. And therefore, we can write this as kilograms per meter per second square. There is a special unit for pressure and that is capital P, which stands for Pascal. These are derived quantities. Now let's look at scalar quantities and vector quantities. Classify the following physical quantities into scalar quantities and vector quantities. Let's go one by one. Speed. Speed is a scalar quantity. It does not have direction. Force definitely has direction. It, therefore, it is a vector quantity. Acceleration has direction as well. So it's a vector quantity. Velocity has direction and it is the vector quantity. Velocity is the vector equivalent of speed. And then we have distance. Distance, there is no direction, therefore scalar. Charge has no direction as well, scalar. Energy itself has no direction. Therefore, energy is a scalar quantity. Pressure, 
pressure also has no direction because pressure acts in all directions. Therefore, it is a scalar quantity. Volume, no direction. Scalar, displacement. Displacement is a vector quantity. And displacement is the vector equivalent of distance. And we have density with no direction. Therefore, scalar. Momentum has direction. It is vector. Area has no direction. And therefore, it is scalar. These are some common scalar and vector quantities. Let's go to graph analysis. Interpretation of graphs of different shapes is a very important skill to have. Let's look at these graphs. The first graph, you can see that it is a straight line and it passes through the origin. This is very important. For a straight line that passes through the origin, this will tell you that the relationship between y and x is such that y is directly proportional to x. And then if you look at the second graph, it looks similar but not the same in that it does not pass through the origin. This is still a straight line with a positive gradient, but it does not pass through the origin. In this case, the relationship between y and x will be y increases linearly with x. That is to say, as x increases, y increases in a linear fashion. That's why we get a straight line here. And then we have these graphs. These two graphs, you can see that at any point, the tangent will always have a positive gradient. And so we can also see that as x is increasing, y is always increasing. Even in this case, as x is increasing, y is increasing. These are the characteristics of this graph. And therefore, the relationship between y and x in both these cases will be y increases with x although not linearly let's look at the next one here you can see we have a curve this is a reciprocal you can see that it does not touch the axis and you can see when we plot y against x at any point the tangent has a negative gradient and these are the characteristics of the graph it is a negative gradient and the graph does not touch the y-axis and the x-axis and if we were to plot y against 1 over x notice the difference here this is x this is 1 over x if we were to plot y against 1 over x we would get a directly proportional graph so in this case what is the relationship between y and x y and x the relationship between the two is that they are inversely proportional y is inversely proportional to x. However, y is directly proportional to 1 over x. These two graphs here, as you can see, the gradient is always negative. And so this tells you that as x is increasing, y is actually decreasing. And the characteristic of this graph is just that the gradient is always negative. The relationship between y and x is that y decreases with x. And finally, we have this. Once again, you can see we have a negative gradient and you can see that as x increases, y is actually decreasing. The relationship between y and x here is that y decreases linearly with x. Again, it decreases in a linear fashion. We can see a straight line. This is the first thing we can see from a graph when we look at it as a whole. Now let's get into more details, how we can analyze the graph even further. How to summarize an investigation by analyzing graphs. There are four things that we can look at. The first one, let's look at what is happening with the pink line here. Here we have a value of y and then what you do is you draw a line to the graph and then you draw a line to the x-axis and you will get the corresponding value of x for the original value of y. This technique is known as interpolation. What we're doing here is we're going to use y values to find the corresponding x values and vice versa. It can work the other way as well. There is another similar method where we do a prediction. So you can see that the graph is the blue line from here to here. However, we could in some instances extend this line. This is called extrapolation. So when we extrapolate, what we are doing is we are making predictions. That means these values were not actually determined in the experiment. These are predictions. So we are going to make predictions by using y values to find the corresponding x values in the region that was not part of the data set. 
Then we go to this orange triangle. This should be a very familiar sight to you. And this is when we find the gradient of the graph. So the gradient of the graph can be determined by using the formula m is equals to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. The change in y over the change in x. Finally, you can see that there is a yellow region here. And this is the area under the graph. So the area under the graph is actually the area between the line, the graph, and the x-axis. And that's the whole topic. I'd like to mention that there is an experiment here at the very end. That is the swinging of the pendulum. I'm not going to cover experiments in this video. So please don't forget to go through that as well. If you've enjoyed this video, if you've learned something, please hit the like button, guys. Thank you very much for doing that. Thank you for watching. See you guys in the next video.